Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, That Model Railway Guy, and welcome to another episode of Model Railway Basics. This one is all about wiring, and as you can imagine, it's a little bit tricky to demonstrate this, since everyone's layout is different, and therefore that means the wiring will be different. As a result, this episode is going to be a little bit more relaxed. I'm just going to walk you through a few demonstrations and examples, and hopefully I'll be able to keep this as clear as possible for you. Now, it's important to note before we get started that wiring on your layout can be as simple or as complicated as you want it to be. But remember, today we're just talking about the very basics. So, without further ado, let's get started, shall we? Okay, so we're really going back to basics here to start off with, and this may be obvious to some of you, but it might not for others. As you can see, we have a circuit of track set up, but in order to control our trains, we need to connect a controller. And the controller has two wires coming from it, with one going to each rail. Now, there are multiple ways to connect these wires to your track. Many manufacturers have power clips that allow you to easily connect the power. Or if you want something a bit more discreet, you can solder the wires directly to the rail, or use fish plates that already have the wires attached. The wires coming from the controller are positive and negative, so this makes one rail positive, now shown in red, and the other negative, which is now shown in green. It doesn't matter which is which, so we could swap them over if we like, and if you're using a DC controller, this will actually swap the direction the train travels in. So, for example, if the controller is switched to the right, but the train travels to the left, you can easily swap the polarity by swapping around the wires. And now when the controller is switched to the right, the loco travels in the same direction. The most important thing is that the positive and negative rails must never come into contact with each other. So if you lay something metal across the tracks, like a screwdriver for example, this will cause a short circuit, and that means your trains won't run and you could damage your controller. Okay, that was a bit over the top, but you get the idea. So we have a circuit of track hooked up with a controller and we can run our trains. Following so far? But what happens if we add some points into the mix? There's two main types of points, insulfrog frog points, also known as isolating points, and electro frog points. Now, an insulfrog frog point means that the frog, which is this small V part, is made of plastic, and there's a very good reason for that. If we look here, you can see that on the outside we have our positive and negative rails, but up by the frog, you can see that the positive and negative rails meet, and if you remember from earlier, that causes a short circuit. Obviously, we don't want that, so by inserting a small section of plastic, we can isolate the two rails so that they don't touch. Insulfrog frog points also have the advantage of allowing us to easily isolate sidings and different lines just by switching the points. So here's another demonstration track, this time with a point and a siding. And when the point is set to go straight on, the loco in the siding won't move, and that's because it's not getting any power. If we look closely, the point blade at the top is touching the rail, and that's allowing the current to continue along the main line. The one at the bottom isn't touching though, which means that power isn't getting through to the siding, and this means we can easily hold engines in sidings like this while we run other locos on the main line. So if we switch the point, the blades are now in the opposite position, which allows power to flow into the siding so we can move our loco. Essentially, all it means is that the engine in the siding will only move if the points are set in the correct direction. And as you can see, when I switch the point back to the siding, it cuts the power to the main line and the loco stops. And when I switch the point back, the loco restarts. This does mean that your power connection has to be before any point, as if you put it after the point, the power can't get through to the siding, as you can see on this diagram here. That said, if the layout is a circuit, then the current will travel all the way around the layout and you'll still be able to access the point no matter where the power connection is. So, if insulfrog frog points are so great, then why do we have electro frog points? Well, for starters, real railway points don't have a small plastic insert in the middle of them, and so as a result, the rails on electro frog points are made entirely of metal. This is great for small locos in particular, as it means they're less likely to stall if their wheels are always touching a powered rail. That doesn't mean they're guaranteed to stall on insulfrog frog points. For example, here is a very small diesel running through a series of insulfrog frog points, and as you can see, it's having no trouble at all. But it's just less likely to happen on the electro frog points. The biggest disadvantage of insulfrog frog points though is that you're relying entirely on the point blades to transfer the power. Now if those blades don't touch the rails properly or if you get a bit of dirt stuck in between them, it may mean you lose power to the rest of your layout. 
With electrofrog points though, everything is live, so you're not relying on those blades. But instead, you may have to think about switching the frog polarity so that you don't get a short circuit and maybe isolating the point and then how you're gonna route the power to the rails beyond. It gets complicated quite quickly. I have nothing against electro frog points, but as this series is aimed at beginners, my advice would be start out with insulfrog frog points. They're much easier to wrap your head around and there's nothing to stop you from looking into electro frog points further down the line. Now, so far we've mostly been talking about DC, but I think it's worth also taking a quick moment to talk about DCC or digital command control as well. Now, DCC differs in that it's constantly outputting a current to the track and each loco moves only when you ask it to. The easiest way to visualize this is with coach lights. On DC, the lights in this coach will only light up when I apply power to the track using the controller. And so as you can see, when the loco stops, the lights in the coach go out too. But on DCC, because the track has constant power, the coach lights are on all the time, regardless of whether or not the loco is moving. This leads us nicely to the biggest advantage of DCC, which of course is the individual control of locos. On DC, if we have two locos on the same section of track, they will both move together. However, on DCC, each loco has a decoder fitted, which is just a little computer chip, and this allows you to control only the loco you select. Now, it's often stated that DCC requires only two wires from your controller to your track, and that's true to a certain extent, Although, if you remember back to the beginning of this video, that was also true for our circuit of track on DC too. In reality though, most people like to have a feed going to each siding, so that things like lights and sound remain on even if the loco is sitting in a siding awaiting its next turn. The final thing to say about DCC is that it's kind of compatible with DC, but it's not really recommended. You can run DC locos on DCC track by selecting zero on the controller, but it's not great for the motors and they make a pretty awful sound as soon as you put them on the track. Similarly, you can run locos with a DCC decoder fitted on normal DC track, but again, they can be a bit erratic. This is a particularly dramatic example to illustrate the point, but it's probably best just to keep the two systems separate if you're thinking about upgrading to DCC in the future. And so that's a very quick introduction on how to wire up a layout. I hope you've learned something from this video and your head doesn't hurt too much. I'm gonna go for a bit of a lie down, but in the meantime, please don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.